Hello and welcome back to Politico's AI and Tech Summit. I'm Vincent Manancourt, a reporter with Politico Europe. Uh, let me remind you that you can take part in this debate using the Swap Card app and you can tweet at uh, hashtag Politico AI. Now I'm joined today by the Minister for Digital for the UK, Chris Philp. Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> Chris, uh, you're beaming in from the UK, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, it's now two years since the UK left the EU. Uh, tell us why should this room full of EU tech policy wonks care what the UK is doing in tech policy right now? Well, look, I mean, we've left the European Union, but we're still very much a European country. We want to uh, closely trade with our European neighbours and friends. Uh, we want to work together on issues of common interest, uh, as we're doing at the moment with this terrible situation in Ukraine. Uh, we want to cooperate on areas of um, regulation. Uh, so I think given our close trading relationship uh, and our close general relationship, uh, it's critical that we work together and people should take a strong interest in that. I think secondly, uh, the United Kingdom is the clear European uh, tech leader. You know, we raised uh, almost 30 billion pounds of uh, private capital for uh, tech businesses last year. That was by far the highest of any European country. It was double the second place country and it was over three times the third place country. There were more tech IPOs on the London Stock Exchange last year uh, than any other European stock exchange as well. So we are absolutely at the heart of Europe's uh, tech ecosystem. We want to stay that way. Uh, we want to be close, friendly, cooperative. Uh, it's in our interests as well as in the interests of European Union member states, big and small. So I think that's why it's important that we uh, stay close together and cooperate. We're also you know, leading the way in so some areas like the online safety bill, um, it started its passage through Parliament uh, just earlier this week with its second reading. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're doing, doing thinking there that may be um, helpful to other countries. Um, but of course, we can learn from what you're doing as well. So uh, mm -hmm. it's vital we keep our relationship close, friendly and cooperative. Um, you've been pipped to the post for digital competition rules, uh, a data pact with Washington, and perhaps even uh, with the Dig Digital Services Act uh, for online harms. Um, forgive me, but it wasn't part of the point of Brexit to be able to do things more quickly and efficiently than the European Union. Well, our uh, online safety bill, which is the UK's equivalent of the Digital Services Act, um, was uh, introduced into Parliament a few weeks ago. It had its second reading uh, on Tuesday of this week, just two days ago, and that is now going to go quickly through Parliament. So I think we're uh, we're doing we're doing uh, being extremely nimble um, there. We're also in the process, as you know, of reviewing our uh, data laws um, to see where we can make improvements to the GDPR regime that we inherited, but obviously in a way which is uh, respects privacy and so on. So we are looking at areas where we can, um, where we can uh, be a little bit more nimble. Uh, but as I say, you know, we want to do this in a spirit of friendship and cooperation because that serves everybody's interests, our interests, but also the interests of European member states. We see this as, as friendly and cooperative, not adversarial. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned there the second reading for the online safety bill. Um, is there anything that you heard from MPs that you'd like to kind of work into the bill now that you've heard them? Mm. Yeah, we, we had a lot of a uh, lot of comments from different MPs. There are some ar areas where we're um, going to think very carefully about whether we can improve the bill. So one of the points that was raised by a number of members of parliament during that debate on Tuesday evening was whether um, some of the platforms, some small platforms which carry very harmful content should be included in the scope of some of the bill's provisions from which they are currently excluded. So we're going to give some very serious thought um, to that. But generally speaking, the, the principles of the bill uh, were very widely supported. In fact, it passed without a vote. It went to on a voice vote because it had cross-party support um, from all the parties in the House of Commons uh, because it's the aims of the bill are to keep uh, children safe online, which everybody agrees with, uh, to prevent illegal content being spread online and to make sure these social media firms have some level of accountability uh, for the content which they're propagating. So the principles had cross-party support, which was, was good to see. And I know other countries around the world um, are looking at this legislation very carefully because it's extremely comprehensive. No other jurisdiction has, led, has yet legislated so comprehensively. Um, so I think it has, a, has the um, potential to become a piece of legislation which um, 
other countries adopt and follow. And because the UK typically is the second largest global market for these big tech firms behind the United States in terms of a, of a single country, um, you know, it may be that social media firms choose to apply some of the requirements in this bill uh, more generally beyond just the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Um, moving on to data policy, data reform that you mentioned, uh, some of your colleagues have said that it perhaps would be uh, worth jettisoning a data deal with Brussels if the reforms bring enough innovation uh, back to Britain and boost the economy there. Is that a position that you maintain? No, we, we intend to uh, design our changes such that um, there is no reasonable technical basis on which the data adequacy decision could be revoked. Uh, so we're acting in good faith uh, on that. We're, we're making sure that there's no technical reason for that to happen. So we're making sure that the changes we made, the flexibilities that we're looking at, um, don't provide a basis on which that could reasonably reasonably happen. Um, as I mentioned, we're making sure that privacy and so on continue to get respected as you would expect, but achieving those outcomes in a way that perhaps is a little bit more flexible. But is it a risk you're willing to take? Well, given that we intend to design these changes, so there is no reasonable technical basis on which the adequacy decision could be revoked, I don't think that is a risk because I'm sure that the European Commission will take this decision or look at this matter on a reasonable technical basis. Uh, and because we're going to design it on a technical basis to be completely uh, compatible with an ongoing adequacy decision, I don't think it's a risk. Uh, part of this reform is, is Britain being able to strike its own data flows deals around the world. Uh, perhaps a landmark one would be with the US. When can we expect a deal with Washington on data? Well, I don't want to sort of comment on uh, confidential discussions. We're obviously having discussions with our US friends in a, in a number of different areas, as, as Europe, the European Commission and European member states are doing uh, as well. Uh, the Prime Minister and President uh, Biden last year entered into a... Uh, into a tech partnership agreement. We're in the early stages of discussing a free trade agreement as well. Uh, so we're working uh, bilaterally on a number of initiatives with the United States, cooperating in a number of areas, um, just as we are uh, with others in the European Union are as well. I think it's important in this dangerous and uncertain world, it's particularly important for like-minded countries, uh, European Union member states, the USA, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Japan, South Korea, you know, these like-minded countries, I think we need to stick together. We need to cooperate in the face of all kinds of challenges that are coming from different parts of the world. So I think cooperation uh, between countries like ours has never been more important than it is today. And we hope to continue working with the EU, the Commission and Member States in that spirit as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe one area that you're co cooperating is in regulating the, the big tech giants. Uh, and I note that Britain seems to be taking a slightly more tailored approach to its digital competition rules. I'm wondering what was the thinking behind that? Well, we want to make sure that we strike the right balance between uh, making interventions that enable and stimulate digital competition without um, imposing burdens on businesses that are too heavy or adopting an approach that isn't that is a bit kind of blunt and a bit general. So it's a balance to strike, and different jurisdictions will strike it in slightly different ways. We've taken, we will be taking a more tailored, targeted approach uh, to try and keep the burden of this regulation as light as it possibly can be. Um, the United Kingdom will always be a jurisdiction which tries to keep uh, regulatory burdens to an absolute minimum, to be tailored and specific rather than kind of general and blunt. We think that's important to foster innovation, to foster business uh, growth. And that's why, in broad terms, we'll be taking uh, that approach. We think it's good for good for business, good for innovation, and good for growth. And we don't want to overdo it and end up uh, stifling innovation or deterring investment, because that doesn't help anybody. Mm -hmm. um, a related question. Do you not think that this case-by-case -case approach is open to abuse by some of the more powerful companies? Well, it means, obviously, that our regulators uh, do need to be uh, sort of attentive and diligent. Um, that's why we've established um, the Digital Markets Unit within the Competition and Markets Authority. So we've got a specialist unit that directly looks at this. Obviously, the large social media firms do have enormous resources, both technical resources and legal resources, and indeed public affairs resources. And so we need to make sure that we've got enough resources and expertise 
to sit opposite them. Um, but we think uh, it is better to do it that way rather than try and do things on a blanket basis. But you're right, it means we need to have uh, the energy and the resources and the attentiveness to make sure we don't get um, bamboozled. But again, I think it's, it's the right, right trade-off to make. Perhaps a slightly more personal question. You're the digital minister. You deal with all of these, all of these issues from competition to online harms. What platforms do you use personally? Are you on Facebook? Are you on Twitter? Do you use Signal, WhatsApp? What are your preferences? Yeah, OK. So for messaging, uh, kind of colleagues and family and friends and that kind of thing, uh, I mostly use uh, WhatsApp and text. Um, in terms of social media, uh, I use Twitter quite a lot just for putting messages um, out there. Um, I've got to say, as an elected politician, if you look at the notifications, um, they're quite often somewhat abusive. So I don't look at the notifications too much, um, but I do use it just to put things out there. Um, Facebook, I did use Facebook when I was younger. I must be honest, I don't use it quite so much um, these days. Uh, I, I'm not on uh, I'm not on uh, TikTok, um, but I'm, uh, I'm I'm watching its uh, its growth with uh, with with keen interest, as you can as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, talking about online content, the the UK has adopted this approach of going perhaps a little bit further than the EU, looking at uh, legal but harmful content. Do you not think that that maybe risks getting into a bit of a legal quagmire on this issue? No, I don't think so, because the, the provisions in the Online Safety Bill that talk about content that is legal but harm, potentially harmful to adults, uh, in that area, we're not trying to ban that speech or anything like that. We're not censoring it. All we're saying is that for the very largest platforms, the sort of Facebook-scale uh, platforms, um, for, the, for, the, for content that falls into that category, and we're going to specify that in uh, secondary legislation, it'll be things like racism and misogyny and anti-Semitism and that kind of thing, then... Um, we're simply asking platforms, the big platforms, to do a risk assessment so they've thoroughly understood what the risks are, have transparent and clear terms and conditions governing what is and is not acceptable, but it's up to the platform to decide what those terms and conditions say. We're not dictating to them. And then to apply those terms and conditions consistently. One of the complaints we often get here, and I'm sure it's the same, uh, you hear the same thing, is that quite often these platforms do not apply their own terms and conditions in a manner that is consistent. And this bill will simply require them to do a risk assessment, uh, to have clear terms and conditions, and to apply them consistently. But we're not dictating what those terms and conditions should say or what content should or should not stay up if it's, um, if it's legal and if it's not harmful to children. If it's harmful to children or if it's illegal, then we are saying that stuff should just not be, not be on these platforms at all. So I think, we've, again, we've struck the right balance in, in, in just making sure everything is done transparently, openly and consistently, which is not happening at the moment, for sure. Um, thanks very much, Minister Philp. This is all we have time for. Uh, we heard how uh, Chris Philp isn't on TikTok, um, but how the UK might be doing something slightly differently with tech policy. Thanks very much. Hang around, guys, for the next panel uh, with my colleague Clotilde Gujal, who's going to talk about the Digital Services Act. Thanks very much. <laughs>